I promised in the last lecture that the solutions we got to the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the free particle, though they are not themselves normalizable and therefore cannot represent physically realizable states, could be used to construct physically realizable states. What that means is that we can take those solutions which themselves are not real and can add them up in a way that we can make something that is real. This is a little subtle. We're constructing something called a wave packet, and basically what that amounts to is adding up a bunch of infinities and getting something finite. Taking these traveling wave solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the free particle, which extend from minus infinity to infinity in the spatial domain, and from minus infinity to infinity in the temporal domain, and summing them up somehow to get something that is localized in the spatial domain. What that means is that we're making a wave packet. A wave packet, the features that, we're ca that we care about, is that it's going to be zero for, say, large negative values of x, zero for large positive values of x, and only non-zero over some domain. What it might look like is, well, zero, some wave activity over a relatively limited region, and then going back to zero. We will see wave packets that look like this later on. I'll give a more concrete example and show some animations. But for now, let's think about the math. How would we go about constructing something like this? What we did in the case of the particle in a box, the infinite square well potential, was when we solved the Schrodinger equation, we got solutions. If our potential looks like this, going to infinity at regions outside of a box, our solutions looked like this. We got sinusoids with an integer number of half wavelengths fitting in our box. That was nice because it allowed us to construct our overall solution to the Schrodinger equation, psi of x and t, as an infinite sum of these stationary state wave functions. The integer number of half wavelengths fitting in the box plus the essentially trivial time dependence that you get from the time equation when you do separation of variables with the general Schrodinger equation. This isn't going to work for the case of the free particle for a couple of reasons. First of all, instead of having a discrete sum over, you know, states which have an index n, for instance, this is our psi sub n, where n goes from 1 to infinity, we now have wave functions psi that are continuous. We did not have quantized states. So our stationary states now are going to have to look like our traveling waves. They're going to have to look like e to the i, k, and then x minus, uh, where did it go, <clears throat> h bar k over 2m t. This was our traveling wave solution from the last lecture. So instead of having our discrete set of states indexed by n, we have our continuous set where the parameter is k. k is a completely free parameter, not fixed to be an integer. The second reason our machinery for the particle in a box won't quite work is this coefficient c sub n. c sub n is also going to have to somehow become a function of k. k now being unrestricted, we can't just treat it as a set of discrete entities. We have to have some function and that function is conventionally written as phi of k. And finally, this sum out front. Again, we can't do a sum if we have a continuous set of functions that we're working with that we want to add up. We have to do an integral. The integral now is going to be an integral over k. So our sum over n became an integral over k. Our coefficient, subscript n, became a function of k and our discrete set of functions, psi sub n, became these traveling wave solutions with the parameter k in them. Our integral dk goes over all the possible values of k from minus infinity to infinity. And this is what the expression is overall going to look like. We have an integral, we have this continuous function, and we have our traveling wave states. The main problem with this expression is this guy. How do we know? How do we find phi of k? 
phi of k is a general function. What we had done to find the analog of this, the analog of this was at c sub n in the case of the uh, particle in a box. What we did for the case of the particle in a box was use Fourier's trick to collapse the sum. Instead of a sum now we have an integral and it's not immediately clear from looking at this what it means for an integral to collapse. We'll see what that means in a second. But first of all, let's go back to what we did in the case of the particle in a box and spell out some of the details so that we can make an analogy. On the left hand side here now we have the results for the particle in a box, whereas on the right hand side we have the results as I have outlined what they might look like for the free particle. So the first thing we did for our particle in a box was to express the initial conditions as an infinite sum of the time t equals zero form of our stationary state wave functions. The second thing we did in manipulating this expression to attempt to find a formula for the c sub n was to multiply on the left by a particular stationary state wave function, not n, m. So we multiplied by root 2 over a sine m pi over a x psi of x 0. This is now looking at the left hand side. So we multiplied by this and we integrated from 0 to a. This integral is taken dx. It's important to note now that this is not the wave function psi, this is the complex conjugate of the wave function psi, and we'll come back to that in a moment. This integral, this is our left-hand side. If we do the same thing to the right-hand side, you end up with an integral dx that you can push inside the sum, you can pull out some constants, and all you're left with then, the only x dependence comes from the sine function here and the sine function you're multiplying in. So we end up, ended up with a sum from n, goes, n equals 1 to infinity of c sub n, our two root 2 over a factors from our two wave functions multiply together, just give us 2 over a, and what we're left with inside the integral is sine of m pi over a x sine of n pi over a x dx. So that was our expression and the nice feature about this is that the sine functions had an orthogonality condition on them that allowed us to tr take this integral from 0 to a and express it as delta m n. The sine functions if m is not equal to n will integrate to 0 over this integral interval. And if m is equal to n, you just end up with 1. I should be including this factor out front in the expression for the orthogonality. What that means is that the sum collapses. The only remaining term is the term from cm. So our right-hand side just becomes cm. This gave us our formula for cm being equal to the integral from 0 to a of essentially root 2 over a sine m pi over a x times our initial conditions psi of x 0. This was a very brief overview of what we did back when we were talking about the particle in a box. Now continuing this analogy into our free particle case, Again, the first thing we're going to do is left multiply by the complex conjugate of the wave function. Now the wave functions that we're working with now are stationary state solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the free particle. And what those look like, if I evaluate them at t equals zero, is e to the minus i k x. Now, I'm leaving off normalization constants because I don't know what they are at this point, but while I have a k in this integral, I shouldn't use k here. This is the same as saying I have an n in this sum, so I shouldn't use n in the function that I'm multiplying through. Things will just get confusing. So I'm going to call this k prime. So I've left multiplied by k prime. I have my wave function, my initial conditions, and again I'm integrating. Now I'm integrating from minus infinity to infinity. 
and I'm integrating dx. This is what I get for the left-hand side, just following by analogy from what we did for particle in a box. The right-hand side, in this case, now instead of having a sum over n, I have an integral over k. What I'm multiplying by from the left is again the e to the minus i k prime x, but this integral that I'm doing, that's an integral dx. So I can exchange the order of integration by k and integration by x. So I'm going to write this right-hand side now a little differently. We have the integral of minus infinity to infinity dk. Then we have phi of k, which is not a function of x, so I can pull it out of my integral over x, same as I could pull my c sub n out of this integral dx. Sorry, phi of k, not phi of x. What I'm left with then is the integral from minus infinity to infinity dx e to the minus i k prime x e to the i k x. Now, in order for this term to be meaningfully, or, to, or in order for this integral to collapse, like the sum collapsed here, we have to have some sort of orthogonality condition. The orthogonality condition for the sine functions from 0 to a was fairly straightforward. The orthogonality condition that applies here for this, where we are integrating over an infinite domain of something with a continuous parameter, k prime and k are continuous parameters that can take on any value, is not a simple Kronecker delta. It's a little different, but it looks very much the same. What you end up with here is called a Dirac delta function, and we will meet these Dirac delta functions in more detail later. If you're interested, there is a video lecture posted on the Dirac delta function and what its properties are. But for our purposes here, this expression evaluates to a Dirac delta function. A Dirac delta function is defined essentially as an infinitely narrow distribution. If you treat this as a distribution that only is non-zero at a particular value, the delta function by default is defined to be non-zero only for its argument equal to zero, this is effectively a distribution that only has non-zero values, only has support for k equal to k prime. If you treat this as a distribution, and you examine the expression integral from minus infinity to infinity dk of phi of k delta of k minus k prime. If this is a distribution, we're integrating a distribution times a function. This is the expected value of phi of k subject to the distribution given by the delta function. The delta function, acting like an infinitely narrow distribution then, simply pulls out the value that phi of k has when k equals k prime. Since this is infinitely narrow, phi of k is effectively a constant over the non-zero domain of the delta function. So it's just effectively averaging a constant over this domain. So this in whole integral here is equal to phi of k prime. That's what it means for an integral to collapse and like I said, if you're not entirely clear on how the delta function works, there's another video lecture on how to go about, or how to understand what the delta function can do for you. For now, notice that we can re-express this phi of k prime then in terms of our left-hand side. Phi of k prime is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus i k prime x psi of x zero integral dx. This completely determines psi, sorry, phi of k. This is the real genius behind what's called Fourier analysis. Um, what we were talking about in the case of the particle in a box was really Fourier series, and now we're talking about Fourier analysis. The way these, the math behind this is usually defined is in terms of something called the Fourier transform. The top two equations here 
are essentially definitions of the Fourier transform. We have some function of x. This is like our wave function as a function of time, and it's being expressed as an integral of some function of k multiplied by e to the i kx, integral dk. This function f, capital F of k, can be determined by essentially what we did in the previous slide. An integral from minus infinity to infinity dx of the function lowercase f of x times e to the minus i kx. The 1 over root 2 pi factors here are customary. Some authors use them, some authors define them slightly differently. It depends on the specific definition of the Fourier transform that you're using. But you can see the nice symmetry between these two equations. You have your 1 over root 2 pi in both equations. You have an integral from minus infinity to infinity in both equations. You have e to the i kx here positive and e to the minus i kx here negative. That's the only difference. Then you have a function of k, integral dk, function of x, integral dx. Up to labeling x and k differently, the only difference between these two equations is the sign in the exponent. There's a lot of really nice math that comes from using Fourier transforms. Um, just to give a very brief example, if you're interested in processing astronomical images, for example, or any images really, treating the image as a function of this k parameter, which is a spatial frequency parameter, instead of treating the image as a function of x, as a function of which pixel you're looking at, you can do some very powerful analysis to uh, identify features, for instance. High spatial frequency features versus low spatial frequency features. Smoothly varying backgrounds versus the boundaries between objects where the image varies rapidly. We'll have different behavior when expressed in terms of this um, function of the spatial frequency. From the perspective of quantum mechanics, what we're interested in is how to express our wave function as a function of position and time. Well, using the Fourier transform definition here, we can find this phi of k by the same sort of, same sort of equation. Phi of k is determined by an integral dx of our initial conditions times a complex exponential. Knowing what phi of k is, we can then determine what phi of x and t is. So again, our initial conditions determine our constant multiples, essentially, of our stationary states, these complex exponentials, which then gives us our overall wave function and how it behaves. To check your understanding, here is a simple example problem that requires you to apply the formulas on the previous page to go from a particular initial condition. In this case, it's a constant our initial wave function looks something like this, zero everywhere except for a region between minus a and a. Your task, find the phi of k that goes with this particular function. That's about it, but before we finish talking about how to superpose these solutions, I want to look at the solutions themselves in a little more detail. Let's talk about the wave velocity in particular. This is our traveling wave solution, and we can figure out what its velocity is by looking at this argument. Which direction is this wave going? Well, if we look at a particular point on this spiral, on this e to the i kx, as time evolves, we can figure out where that point on the spiral is by setting this argument equals to a constant. Since I don't really care about what that constant is, I'm just going to set that equal to zero. So let's say kx minus h bar k squared over 2m t is equal to zero. If I continue along these lines, it's clear that in this case, if t increases, this part of, the, uh, of this expression is getting more negative. This part expression of the expression has to get more positive. So that means x has to increase as well. So as t increases, x increases, that means this wave is moving to the right. The next question I can ask is how fast? How fast is it moving? And if you look at this again as setting this expression equal to zero, I can solve this 
and say x is equal to h bar k over 2m t. And in this case, the velocity is pretty clear. We have this constant, x equals some constant times time. Position equals something times time. This is our velocity. What this actually is, in terms of the energy of the particle, requires knowing what the definition of k is. So we have h bar over 2m, and the definition of our k was root 2me over h bar. So our h bars cancel out, and if we finish this expression, moving the 2m effectively under the square root, we get the square root of e over 2m t. So the velocity we get here is square root of e over 2m. Now, classically, what we get, we have a particle moving at some velocity and it has some energy. We know the relationship between those. It's the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, gives me e. And if I solve this, I get v squared equals 2e over m, or v equals root 2e over m. These expressions are not equal to each other. That's a little strange. The velocity that we got from quantum mechanics looking at how fast features on this wave function move is not equal to the classical velocity. Will this hold true regardless? Do quantum mechanical particles have a different propagation behavior? That doesn't really make a lot of sense. This is actually not a problem because what we're measuring here is the velocity of a feature on this wave. It's not actually the velocity of a wave packet. And since wave packets are the only real states that we can get that we expect to observe in the physical universe, what we need to figure out is the wave packet velocity. In order to figure out the wave packet velocity, consider this wave packet. This is just a sum of two wave, two traveling waves with different k's, which I've now indexed k1 and k2. What I'd like you to do is think about expressing k1 and k2 as if they were near each other. So k1 is slightly less than k2, for example, or k1 is slightly greater than k2. Under these circumstances, it makes sense to rewrite these things. I'm going to define alpha as k1 plus k2 over 2, the average, times x, minus h bar k1 squared plus k2 squared over 2m t. Essentially, the difference, or sorry, the sum of the argument of this and the argument of this. I'm also going to define a parameter delta, which is k1 minus k2 over 2x minus h bar k1 squared minus k2 squared over 2m t. Um, actually, sorry, I don't mean 2m's here. I mean 4m's here. Because I have a factor of 2 from the over 2m, and I have a 1 half, essentially, from the way I'm combining the two terms. So given these definitions, you can express this as not writing it there, as e to the i alpha plus delta plus e to the i alpha minus delta. So you see what I've done here? I've just re-expressed the arguments here as sums and differences. This is getting into the idea behind sum and difference and product identities in trig functions, except I'm doing this with complex exponentials instead. If I write this function as alpha plus delta, and when I add alpha and delta, for instance, this first term gets me k1 plus k2 plus k1 minus k2, the k2s drop out, and I end up with 2k1 over 2, which is just k1 times x. Just k1x, essentially. What you want to get from this 
If I express these exponentials in that way, you can factor out the, del or the alpha part. You get an e to the i alpha times an e to the i delta plus e to the minus i delta. If you're familiar with the complex exponential form of trig functions, you can probably see where I'm going with this. This is going to end up equal to e to the i alpha times cosine, actually not just cosine, 2 cosine of delta. What this looks like in the context of our discussion of wave packets is if we have uh, an axis there, we have this cosine factor, and it's the cosine of delta. If k1 and k2 are near each other, this will be a small number. This will also be a relatively small number. So delta evolves much more slowly with space and time than alpha. So if I was going to, if I was going to draw this wave function, I would have some slowly varying envelope, like this, and superposed on top of that, multiplied by that slowly varying envelope, is e to the i alpha, which is the sum. So if k1 is close to k2, this is going to evolve much more rapidly. So my overall wave packet is going to look something like this, where you have zeros and areas with large amplitude, areas with small amplitude, areas with large amplitude, areas with small amplitude. As time evolves, this wave packet will propagate. And if what we're interested in is the velocity with which the overall packet propagates, you can consider a point on delta, not a point on alpha. If we're interested in the velocity with which these rapidly moving peaks, rapidly oscillating peaks, evolve, then we would look at alpha. But since what we're interested in now is the wave packet, we want to look at delta. We want to look at the slowly varying envelope, how quickly the slowly varying envelope moves. Now, I haven't actually constructed a fully formed, physically realizable wave packet here because I have this cosine term, which again extends all the way from minus infinity to infinity. But hopefully, conceptually, you can think about this as a sort of rudimentary wave packet. The question then is, how fast does the rudimentary wave packet move? Well. If I look at delta, and if I assume that k1 is near k2, we can see how that works out. So what I'm looking at here is delta is equal to zero, say. The same sort of argument that I was using to determine how fast a, figure, a feature on a single wave moved. Setting this delta equal to a constant, not caring what the constant was, and setting it equal to zero. What I get then is k1 minus k2 over 2 x being equal to h bar over 4m and then k1 squared minus k2 squared I'm going to look at this as the difference of two squares which I can factor k1 plus k2 times k1 minus k2 I can then cancel out this and this and what I'm left with is just x over 2 equals to h over 4m k1 plus k2. If I assume that k1 is about equal to k2 then, I can pretend that this is some effective average k, k bar. If I write that out, sorry, this is 2k bar, twice k bar, since I have k1 and k2, and they're added together. I can then look at this. I have a 1 over 2 here, a 1 over 4 here, and a 2 here. What I end up with at the end is just going to be x equals h bar over m times k bar. This is different than the expression we got before. K bar now is going to be our average sort of our average k, h bar over m to copy that over, and our k was root 2 m e bar now for k bar. Instead of k bar I'll have e bar for my average. And then I have Planck's constant. 
I can cancel out Planck's constant in the denominator. I can again push my mass into the square root here. And what I'm left with then is root 2e over m times time. I forgot my times time here. All of these have a times time. So x equals something times time. This is our velocity. So here, for the wave packet velocity, we get root 2e over m. This is the classical velocity. So problem solved. Whereas the features on each individual peak, for instance, in our wave function, traveled at one velocity, the overall wave packet traveled at another velocity. For the case of this particular wave packet, or wave packets in general, the wave packet itself travels at the velocity you would expect. Except I have to be clear here now. Let me rewrite this. The velocity we get for a wave packet now, this is only approximate, so I should write it as approximately equals, and it's not twice the energy, it's twice the average energy divided by mass in the square root. So this is not exactly the classical formula because now we don't necessarily have a single energy. If we had a single energy, we would be stuck with one of those solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which have definite energy. In the case of this part of this free particle, those definite energy solutions extended throughout all space, and that was a problem. So we don't actually have a definite energy, so we'll have some spread in energies here. And if you have a large spread in energies, you'll effectively get a large spread in velocities. And what starts off as a wave packet will not stay a wave packet very long. It will propagate at different speeds. Different parts of the wave packet will propagate faster than others. But at any rate, what this actually looks like, to make some some visuals here, and I couldn't hope to draw this accurately, but if we have some wave packet at time t equals zero, delta t, two delta t, and three delta t, it's going to propagate gradually. You can see the disturbance these wa of this wave moving to the right. Now I've drawn solid thick lines here behind it to designate the motion of the overall wave packet. The overall packet is moving at a speed more or less determined by the slope of these thick black lines. The thin gray lines identify features. For instance, this peak becomes this peak, becomes this peak, becomes this peak. This peak is traveling at a more slow rate than the overall wave packet and is essentially sort of falling off the back of the packet. It's decreasing in amplitude as it goes. And the slopes of these line are different, lines are different, meaning the features on the waves are propagating at a different speed than the overall wave packet. This is actually a general feature of many waves. It's not something we hear about very often in everyday life because we never really think about whether there might be a difference or not. Plus, most of the common waves that we work with, like sound waves for instance, don't have this property. But if you look closely, for instance, if you drop a rock in a still pond, the small scale ripples actually behave with this different velocity. In that case, actually, the features on the wave move faster than the overall wave packet. So in that case, you could view this as sort of time reversed, where the features start at the back of the wave packet and propagate forwards. But this is really the question of what's called group velocity and the question of phase velocity. The phase velocity refers to the features in the wave, whereas the group velocity refers to the velocity of the wave packet. This is not a wave mechanics course, but there are there's a lot of interesting math that can be done with this. The group velocity and the phase velocity being different is one of the one of the more interesting features of, for instance, propagation of electromagnetic waves in plasmas in space. So if you're interested in radio astronomy, for instance, you need to know about this in very high levels of detail. To give you a better feel for what this looks like, here's an animation. What we're looking at now are the real and complex parts, shown in red and blue respectively, of a hypothetical wave packet that might represent a solution to the Schrodinger equation. It doesn't actually represent a solution to the Schrodinger equation, but this is the sort of behavior we're looking at. If I track a particular 
pulse, say this one, I'm moving my hand to the right as I do so. Here. But I'm not moving my hand to the right nearly as fast as the overall wave packet is propagating. So the overall wave packet is propagating at effectively twice the speed of the individual features on the wave. So this is what uh, wave propagation may, might actually look like for the Schrodinger equation. You can construct wave packets like this. If you add the time dependence then, you can determine how the wave, prop wave packet will propagate, how it will spread out, how the individual wave features will move, and you'll know effectively everything you need to. To check your understanding, here are a few true or false questions. Don't think that because they're true or false, they're easy. Think about these in detail.